Hello and welcome to West Indies on 99.94 Cricket Every Day. My name is Mashal St. Patrick Hewitt, one half of the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. And with me as ever is Santoki Nagilendran, also one half of the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. West Indies on 99.94 is your new home for West Indies cricket content. And we'll be dropping into your podcast feed on YouTube or the 99.94 app several times every week. So please rate, review and subscribe. And thanks for joining Cricket's Conversation. Today on West Indies on 99.94, we're going to be talking about West Indies' short T20 tour of Australia. Santelki, take it away. Yeah, and we're going to look at West Indies. They lost 2-0 to Australia in two bilateral T20 internationals. Now, I guess the main thing is they're sort of warm-up matches for the World Cup coming up. So... We can't look at it too deep in the context of it being a series loss. However, there is a pattern of our last T10, T20 internationals. We've lost eight. So there is a poor run of form at the moment. But we're here to sort of dissect how West Indies set out their 11 team combinations and what we can look forward to ahead of the World Cup. Now, Mash, it's only right we start at the top of the order. So a lot of the talk has obviously been about we've got four openers in the squad, Johnson Charles, Brandon King, Carl Mayers, Evan Lewis, who's going to be the two that start at the World Cup? It seems like it will be Brandon King and Carl Mayers based on form. However, I was surprised um, in the two T20s against Australia that we opened up with uh, Carl Mayers and Johnson Charles for both T20 internationals. So Evan Lewis didn't get a game. Brandon King came at number three. Now, that's interesting for a whole variety of factors. The main one being Evan Lewis didn't get a game. Now, it's unusual because Evan Lewis um, was with the Patriots at CPL and they exited the competition early. So he was one of the first group of players to fly out to Australia. So he's had more time to acclimatise, get ready for the matches. So it seems strange, unless there's an injury issue, which hasn't been publicly declared, that Evan Lewis didn't even make the 11 for the 2 T20. So that, that leads to the question of whether we will see him start in the 11 at the World Cup. And it's also interesting, based on form, Brandon King and Carl Mayer seem like they will be the two openers. However, they weren't given these games to open. Now, it depends on... We've got two more warm-up games coming up. Depends if they go with that combination. But it's interesting, Mash, that they put Johnson Charles in as opener. He had a tough time in both games. Um, it'd be interesting to get your thoughts on sort of the rationale and thinking behind Johnson Charles opening with Carl Mayer. I mean, I don't see... I, I'd like to believe... Sorry, let me start again. I'd like to believe that Charles has had these two games purely to give him a go. And that a lot will be told by what happens in the warm-up games versus UAE and, and the Netherlands. It would shock me if Evan Lewis doesn't get a, at least one game, if not both, heading into, heading into the actual World Cup qualifiers themselves or the qualifying stage um, itself and that first game versus Scotland. I think more... <laughs> I think more baffling is... And maybe some people say, actually, that's what they expected. But if you've had a proven opening partnership of King and Mayers, why disturb it? If you want Charles to come in, why not let him be the one who comes in at number three? Let's not forget that Brandon King was a CPL top scorer, opening for the Talawas, opening for the championship side, the Talawas. So it, it just seems bizarre to me. Yes, I know that Charles King... Mayers were effectively the top three scorers in CPL, but it's bizarre to me to make King be the one to have to move in order to accommodate Johnson Charles. And potentially even more interesting of a talking point than Johnson Charles opening was to see Johnson Charles take the gloves in the first game. Now, Puran took the gloves in the second game. So there's also the question mark about is Charles going to get shoehorned in because of Nicholas Puran's reluctance to want to wicket keep um, for the T20 side? Now, I'm going to hand this one back to you, Santoki, because I think that Puran just, he just has to draw the short straw here and realise that for the better balance of the side, he probably needs to wicket keep. But I understand that due to the pressure of captaincy, Puran possibly doesn't want to wicket keep and be seen as one of our gun go-to batters as well as being the captain himself. So there's a lot of uh, factors at play here. 
Yeah, hundred percent. And when I spoke to Puran, interestingly enough, before the IPL, I asked him, um, how does he feel about wicket keeping and batting for his franchise? Because before, when he was at Punjab, KL Rahul was the wicket keeper. Puran was the sole batsman. He came to Sunrisers and he had to take up wicket keeping again. Now his answer was interesting. He said he doesn't particularly mind not wicket keeping. Now for me, if you're a wicket keeper and you truly love love it, you'll always want to wicket keep. So the fact he said he didn't mind means. I don't think he particularly wants to wicket keep at this point in time. As you said, he's got the burden of captaincy and also being one of the more senior players in the side. So I reckon that's what happened. I said, Paul Rand's probably told the coaches that he'd rather not wicket keep. And hopefully if Charles can wicket keep and put together big runs, then that solves the problem. However, the issue is now Charles has struggled in the last T20. He labored to 29 of 30 runs. So it's a massive issue. I don't see how Charles justifies a place in the side unless you're saying essentially he's a wicketkeeper for the side and we're just going to hope he puts together the runs. But I think he doesn't fit into it. It would be harsh on Evan Lewis to sort of miss out or even a Shamar Brooks because you have to um, put Johnson Charles in. But it's a it's a massive point. If Puran doesn't actually want to wicketkeep, I mean, as you said, we saw him wicket keep in the second T20. So maybe that's a compromise. He will do it reluctantly um, if he has no choice. But if his heart's not in it and they do have to go with Johnson Charles, it opens up. it does open up a problem for the combinations we have at hand. And as, as you rightly said, Mash, it is strange that they dropped Brandon King down to three because you think if you've got the momentum, him and Carl Mayers as openers, surely you put that together in the run um, for these games before the World Cup. Yeah, I, I think, like I say, it, a lot, it will be very interesting to see um, what changes for that UAE game and probably more specifically what changes for that Netherlands game because you would assume for the Netherlands game on Wednesday that it will represent the most likely starting 11 for the for the Scotland game or you'd expect to see at least 95% of the players that will play against Scotland should feature in that Netherlands game. I think if you look at the second T20 versus Australia, the because in fairness, in fairness, let's give the side some credit. We can look at the bowling in the second. They nearly defended the 145 or 146 that they got in the first T20. The second one was never close. But if you look at that, uh, the second T20 for a moment, you can see that there is going to be some batting reconfiguration. Because in that second T20, and I say this with the greatest of respects to Jason Holder, he came in at number five. Now, there is no there is no West Indies T20 side where Jason Holder is coming in at number five, Robin Powell at number six, and Akil, Hase- Akil Hussain at number seven. That side, to me, clearly has one batter light. Um, and then you have to assume, Santolkin, it's bizarre what I'm about to say to you. We've gone from the two of us saying... How did we ever get into a position where Shamar Brooks is the open of West Indies to now <laughs> saying Shamar Brooks might be the saviour of West Indies <laughs> coming into... Because if I look at that batting lineup, Santoki, it might be Shamar Brooks who is the glue that ties it all together after all. Yeah, 100%. And there seems to be a lot of anticipation for Shamar Brooks getting into, getting into Australia. And um, I think it's just... With Brooks, obviously, as we said in T20, it's all about momentum. Brooks is currently the informed batsman in the West Indies based on his CPR performances in that final week. So as you said, I think as well, ironically, yeah, he Shamar Brooks has the unique attributes of being able to kind of glue this side together, which is full of power hitters and guys who can score quickly, but guys who also lose their wicket quickly. So Shamar Brooks is essentially kind of the final piece in the jigsaw if you're looking at it at the moment, which is crazy to think. But as you know, we say never a dull day in West Indies cricket. So Shamar Brooks could be the guy that takes us out of the qualifiers and in, into the group stages. But also just to touch on as well, since we're focusing on the batting, I guess another reason we didn't point to is if you look at Nicholas Poran, I think in his last 10 innings, if you take in CPL and T20 internationals, he's only scored more than 20 once. Um, and as a main batsman in the side, that's a dreadful run of form. So for me as well, Poran's lack of form is a massive concern. It'll be interesting to see if he can regain that. But that also could be why he's um, suggested or it's been suggested he removed the wicketkeeping duties because of that poor one of form. Now, it's also important to consider as well, as you said, um, one of the T20s was, was particularly close. Most of the players landed on Monday, so they only really had less than two days to acclimatise after having a 35-hour flight. So I guess as well, we can't analyse the form 
too much. As you rightly pointed out earlier, I think the UAE and um, Scotland warm up. So is it Scotland, UAE and um, Zimbabwe, is it? Or some, something like that. Netherlands, 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 Netherlands that's Netherlands, it. Netherlands. Netherlands on. Those two warm up games are going to be more true to life in terms of our current form and what side we put out against the World Cup. But it was good to get game practice against Australia. And as you said, it wasn't all drab. The bowling performance really stood out. And I guess that's something we're going to touch on, Mesh. Yeah, I think let's take a quick break. And then um, after the break, let's look at the bowling. You're listening to Cricket's Conversation on 99.94. Whatever your team, we have the show for you on podcast, YouTube, or on the 99.94 app. We have India, England, South Africa, West Indies, and now Sri Lanka covered. If you want to find us, the best way is to follow us on social media at 9994DM by downloading the 9994 app or Google 99.94 on podcast. We speak cricket. Yeah, so if we if we look at the bowling, Santolki, arguably across the two games, there were some strong performances in the bowling department, which you could say bodes well for West Indies. We have to remember that this tournament's in Australia, so there's going to be quite a few decks which hard bounce, hard, if, if we, the, sorry, the bouncy tracks, if you can bowl hard lengths, it's going to suit an array of our bowlers. And we've already seen in the warm-up games, Alzari Joseph, five wickets for 38 runs, which is phenomenal, going at an economy of under five, um, an average of seven. And it's probably no surprise, Santoki, that Alzari, I mean, he's been, our, apart from Akil Hussain, he's, he is our go-to strike bowler in the other, has sorry, in the ODI format. And he's finally, after the longest while, it's unbelievable, Santoki, that it, he only made his T20 debut for the West Indies this year. And that's bizarre, given how good Alzari Joseph is with the white ball. And it's probably no surprise to see him do so well in the warm-up games in terms of Australian conditions. And we know what Obed McCoy is going to do. He only played the one game, but we know what uh, the, the strengths of Obed McCoy. We saw... Although he was expensive in the first game, we saw that uh, Sheldon Cottrell struck in the power play twice. So we know what Sheldon Cottrell can do. Even old Dean Smith, across the two games, two wickets for 43, economy at seven, he was able to bowl um, hard lengths. So Akil didn't take any wickets in, in the one game he bowled, but again, his economy, seven. So there's there's some signs if we, if we kind of take Alzari, Akil, and Obed, we kind of know that those three are going to be relatively consistent. So let's say that's 12 overs we can potentially rely on going into the, the, the qualifiers. Jason Hold will be in there. You'd like to think that he will be relatively consistent as well. So let's be, let's be optimistic, Santoki, and say that's 16 overs <laughs> we can potentially rely on. <laughs> and then it's a case of what do we do with the other four overs that we got to find from an assortment of, I don't know, Old Dean Smith, Carl Mayers. Uh, I don't know if Yannick Karai will get a go, so on and so forth. But what's your take on the bowling, Santoki? Yeah, no, I think... It's been a massive boost for the bowling to have Alzari Joseph in the side. We've said for the longest time, past two, three years, how there's we don't have enough strike bowlers in the format. Um, we've been relying on Obed McCoy recently. There's a lot of pressure on McCoy to take wickets, but we've seen in these two T20 matches against Australia, Alzari Joseph is now ready to lead with his strike bowling, taking wickets and sharing that workload with Obed McCoy. So I think it bodes very well. I think the combination of Obed McCoy and Alzari Joseph will take bundles of wickets in the, on Australian pitches. And as you said, Akil Hussain is definitely going to play and be one, another bowler. And Odian Smith, as much as he's inconsistent, when he is on his day, he can be unplayable with the ball, with his, the pace he generates. And um, so for me, I think we the bowling is, is very um, settled at the moment. It'll be interesting to see if we go with Sheldon Cottrell, because I know he took wickets in the power play, but he was sort of indisciplined and inconsistent throughout the rest of the inning. So I don't know if they take the gamble and say, all right, Sheldon Cottrell can get wickets early on. Maybe we just go with him and have the tandem of Joseph, McCoy and Cottrell as sort of um, wicket-taking pace bowlers, which will massively help us. Um, and yeah, other than that, I think it'd be interesting to talk about uh, Yannick Carey because he, the first match, I think he went for 15 runs, very well, very well disciplined. The second one, two overs, 28 runs. Um, so would you put Yannick Carey in? Do you think there's any need for him in this side? It's a tough one, Santoki. Mate, uh, I think we saw in those two T20s, two, we saw two different things with Yannick. First, we saw 
just the kind of harsh reality of being a leg spinner in the world game. It's a, it's a, it's a tough craft. One day you can bowl four overs and look like you're the best leg spinner in the world. Another day you're getting licked down by everybody because a, a few come out sloppy and so on and so forth. And we saw that across the two T20 nationals. We also saw his, in, his inexperience. He's never been to Australia before in terms of in these high pressured environments, much less the conditions. Um, and then I think also um, on top of that, we saw the fact that he's only ever played four T20, like top class, four t- uh, T20s anyway. So I think it's a big call, Santoki, to go into the World Cup qualifiers with a spin duo of Akil and Yannick. Now, some... <laughs> it, it'll be interesting to see what the other sides do. How many other sides are going to go in with two spinners? And if they go in with two spinners because they believe conditions will help them with two spinners, then you almost feel that West Indies have to go in with two spinners. But I just, it's a big, it's a big gamble to just throw Yannick in with his lack of experience and say, off you go. Um, and the thing is, we, we kind of said it in the, in the World Cup uh, squad show that we did. If things don't go well for Yannick across this World Cup and he's thrown into kind of the lion's den, the, the selectors will get an almighty cuss out because it was a gamble call. So do you know what? I'm going to sit on the fence with this one, Santoki, and and ask you, would you pick Yannick in your starting 11? No, I wouldn't. I definitely wouldn't pick Yannick. I just think there's no particularly need to have two full-time spinners. However, as you said, conditions may dictate it. I think one disadvantage West Indies have with this side is in previous generations, the likes of Marlon Samuels and Chris Gale could turn their hand in, especially Gale. He, I think he bowled in 2016 in the power play as well. And they could kind of keep the runs down. We don't really have that unless we go with, if Puran's not wicket keeping, maybe give a few overs to Puran, but we don't have part-time spinners who can be effective. So essentially if the pitch dictates that you need extra spin other than the four overs of a kill, we might have to go with Yannick Carey. Um, but I just think, based on Australian pitches, how they've been over the past few years and the makeup of the side, I don't think Yannick Carey is necessarily needed for the side. I'd rather have an extra uh, pace, ball, like put a Cottrell in, have an extra pace bowler um, to suit conditions rather than have Carey. But as you said, we never know what the, what the um, pitch would dictate. We could very well go with Akil Hussain and Carey, but I just think that takes away an extra dimension from the 11. Well, you know what? Here's, here's what we're going to do. and Let's leave this one for after. Let's take another quick break. And let's say after the break, Santoki, let's 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 put our let's put our selectors hats on and let's pick let's pick the eleven that starts the first qualifier game against <laughs> Scotland. If you love the language of cricket and want more, then head over to the ninety nine point nine four app, and you can hear all of our podcasts and cricket commentary. We're adding new shows all the time and covering cricket series from all over the world. Be the first to hear all of our announcements by following us on social media at 9994DM. Welcome to Cricket's Conversation. Okay, I'm back with my selectors hat on, Santoki. And um, (laughs) we got our selectors hat on. And uh, let's pick the 11, Santoki. Let us, and I think... Boy, it's hard. It's hard because we didn't plan this. People, we've done this off the cuff here. No planning time. Um, it's a, it's actually difficult, Santoki, because there's so many question marks within the side still. But I'm gonna I'm gonna go with this. I'm gonna write it as we're talking. We're, see, we're ready to put our we're ready to put our, our heads on the chopping block, people. Here's my eleven. Mayors, and you might want to write get a pen and paper and write this down, Santoki, because yeah. you might you want to keep track here. Mayors and King to open. I can't believe what I'm about to say here. Now. Brooks at three. <laughs> <laughs> Brook, Brooks at three. Puran at four. No, this don't work. Brooks at three, Puran at four. Oh my God. Okay, see, this is, you know, this is how you know this is live, people, and we're not even planning. Santoki, I'm changing my order. Here we go again. Mayors no. and King. Yeah. Lewis at three, Brooks at four, but Brooks to float, depending on match situation. Yeah. Puran at five, Powell at six, Holder at seven, Odin at eight, Akil at nine, McCoy, sorry, Joseph, Joseph at 10, McCoy 
11. Let me just check my bowlers. Akil, Joseph McCoy, Holder, that's 16 overs. And then the last four to come from a combination of Mayers and Odin. That's my sights in Telkis. I'll just read it one more time. Mayers, King, Lewis, Brooks, but he's floating depending on the situation. Puran, Powell, Holder, Odin, Akil, Alzari, Obed, which means the missing out four are Rifa, Yannick, Sheldon, Charles. Okay, fair enough. I think, um, all right, let me go for my one. This, this is a freestyle guy, so off the top, we're going to go. All right, so my one will be Mayers and King, open him. <sighs> I'm going to have to go with Brooks at three, you know. Brooks at three to shore up the bat in. Poran, Rothman, Holder, Akil, Odin, Joseph McCoy, Cottrell. So, based on ah. that, similar to you, so- except... I'm going with one less batsman I'm putting Cottrell in. Essentially, Lewis holds a drop for me and you put Cottrell in and I'll gamble on Cottrell, Joseph and McCoy taking the bulk of wickets because I think wickets are more valuable at this point in time. I'd rather have um, an extra bowler to sort of show it up. So when I started my initial team and I had Brooks at three, that's what I was going to do. I was going to have an extra bowler. And then I just thought, wait a minute, are we really saying Evan Lewis doesn't get in this side? So people... Do you know what? We're now going to hand that to you. So mm. Santoki and I have basically picked identical sides minus one difference. Santoki doesn't have Lewis in and has Cottrell in. I've got Lewis in and Cottrell out. Now, people, we hand it to you. So the four players that we effectively have out are a common... We've definitely both got Yannick out. We've both got uh, Johnson Charles out. We've both got Raymond Reefer out. And then we disagree on whether it should be Cottrell or Lewis who holds a drop after that. So people... Now let's give it to you. Get in the comments. Get in the comments. Whether you're atting us at Carib Cricket, whether you're at in 99.94 DM, whether you're in the comments below on YouTube, let us know what you think. And whilst you do that, also remember to rate, review, and subscribe to West Indies at 99.94 DM. But Santolki, I'll let you have the last word. Yeah, so let us know. I'm sure a lot of you will have different opinions as to your 11 for the West Indies World Cup. But as we said, it'll be interesting to see how we go in the warm-up matches. And in just over a week's time from recording, we'll be playing our first T20 World Cup match against uh, Scotland. So let's let's hope, me, well, me and Mash, we're going to be up at 5 a.m. watching that. So let's hope for our sakes that West Indies manage to get a win. But either way, it'll be exciting to watch. And Mash, we'll be back soon looking at, I guess we'll be analysing the warm-up games and the World Cup games as they come. But from us, that's it for now. And we'll catch you on the other sides, guys. Stay locked. <laughs>